And she really called for women to basically not go to the mikvah, which is a ritual bath that in traditional Jewish marriages, you go, you don't have intimacy during the week that the wife is menstruating and afterwards. And then you go to this ritual bath. Um, I'm sure that's a, a whole other episode that you've probably done or will do. Um, and then you sort of reunite. So the push was for women to sort of choose not to participate in this process in order to support Agunot. Welcome or welcome back to this channel. My name is Frida Weisel, and here I explore the Hasidic Jewish society in the modern world. Today, I want to delve into a very difficult, very large topic, the Aguna crisis, the crisis of the chained wife who's unable to get a religious divorce. What prompted this interview is the recent enormous upheaval around the story of Malti, a Hasidic woman from my hometown of Kiris Joel, who has been unable to get a religious divorce for four years. In recent weeks, Orthodox Jewish social media has been animated by a campaign to free Malki, spearheaded by the activist Flatbush Girl. Flatbush Girl has held protests in the insular village of Kiris Joel. In synagogues, her team flew a plane with the words free Malki on it. And recently, she called for a sex strike in order to protest Malki's plight. All of this is very intense and complicated, and I wanted to learn more about Aguna crisis, Aguna activism, and more. So today, I am delighted to have on here Keshet Star. Keshet Star is the CEO of the organization for the resolution of Agunit, or in short, Aura, an organization that fights for the plight of Agunis, or alternatively pronounced Agunit. Keshet is a writer, speaker, thinker, reader, and talker. I took this succinct description of her Twitter bio. So... Welcome, Keshet, and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I would like to start by explaining to my audience what an aguna is, with the assumption that many people don't know anything about the circumstances in which this aguna problem arises. Absolutely. So the nutshell of it is that in Jewish law, and we're talking traditional Jewish law, so Orthodox, to some extent conservative, there is a totally separate divorce that you need to get in order to be considered free to remarry under Jewish law. So even if you're divorced according to the state, you are not divorced in the Jewish community until you get this separate Jewish divorce, which is called a get. And what's different about a civil divorce and a get is that a civil divorce comes from the state. So if you think of a wedding ceremony, the officiant will say, you know, by the power vested in me by the state of New York, I now pronounce you man and wife. That's because civil marriage in the U.S. is top down. The state decides you get married and the state can end your marriage. But in Jewish law, marriage is more of a commitment between the couple that has to be created by the couple and then ended by the couple. So it's just set up in a really different way than what we're often used to in the American legal system. So what happens in a Jewish divorce that would make it so that the woman ends up chained, but as far as I understand, the man does not have that problem. So it's a great question. And the truth is, it is possible to have the issue on the other end. For a get ceremony, so this Jewish divorce, to be valid, it has to be willingly given by the husband and then willingly received by the wife. So if either one is not cooperating with that, we have a problem. I would say at ORA, over 95% of our cases involve men who are refusing to give the get. There's a 5% of cases where women are refusing to receive the get. And there's a lot of reasons that have to do with both Jewish law and just general cultural dynamics that impact why you almost always see that kind of disparity in the numbers. Is there not an issue that if a woman decides, well, I don't want to give my husband a divorce, let's say I want to spite him, that he can use <laughs> Jewish legal dis uh, recourse, he can use certain hal halachic opportunities to free himself from the marriage, release himself from the marriage, while the woman is not able to do the same. 
right? Definitely. So there's really two halakhic Jewish legal elements that I think explain why you see this disparity. And the first is that there is a thing out there called a hetzer mer rabbanim. It literally means a permission from a hundred rabbis. And what it basically is, it's designed to be used in extreme situations. And the idea is that if the wife is not willing or able to accept the get in an extreme situation, this tool, this hetzer mer Rabbanim can be used to basically allow the husband to marry a second time. Now, most responsible batidin, that's the term in Hebrew for a religious court, most religious courts will not consider this kind of ruling unless the wife is in a permanent vegetative state. So we're talking about pretty sad and you know, extreme situations. However, there is a guy in Muncie where you can pay him $50,000 and get one of these documents. And if you have $50,000 to spare, then you can do that. So for a guy that's trying to go through this process in a really sort of mainstream upstanding way, it's not so simple. And that's why we do have this mini caseload where we help people in these situations. But the fact that the Hetzer Mayor Rabbanim even exists, I think, changes how people think about this and how people operate. And the second piece is that under Jewish law, say the wife were to say, you know what, forget the get. I'm not going to worry about this, whether he's giving it or not giving it. Too bad. I'm going to move on with my life. If she were to then have children in a new relationship, those children would be considered illegitimate under Jewish law and would have a lot of difficulty remarrying in the traditional Jewish community. And so, and that's something that would impact women and not men. And that's something that comes up a lot. I speak with Aguno regularly and some will say that, you know what, even if I am ready to take a risk, the idea of doing something that might then impact the choices that my future children are going to have or the religious communities that they can be part of as a mother, that's a big deal to take on and decide for someone else. So I think that also is one of the reasons why you do see that disparity. I see. Okay. I thought that it was because the get, the language around the get is he gives the get and she receives the get. In fact, the very process is about giving and receiving. And so it was my understanding that the man has all the power because he's the one who decides if he wants to give it. So the, Am I wrong? So yes and no. The man is the initiator in the process. And there was no question that when it comes to the get the man has the upper hand in that process. However, it is something that can be an issue on the other end. And I think a lot of people just don't know about that. So it could be that more people would refuse to accept gets if they knew it was an option. And it's just not something that we talk about so much. So it's it's not as even as people think, but there is a, a definite power advantage often to the man because he's kind of the initiator of the process. I see. You know, actually, I want to talk a little bit about the get process, what it looks like. It looks, I'm sure, very different from a civil divorce. Can you speak to that? Definitely. So you do a get ceremony. And what I'll share is that there's kind of a sliding scale in that you have the classic traditional ceremony. And there are also ways that the traditional ceremony can be adjusted to meet the needs of the situation. So that's something that we will counsel people on. If the regular option isn't going to work for you for safety reasons, for any other reasons, there are other paths. But the traditional way to do it is that you go in front of a religious court. This is a panel of three rabbis and they have a scribe. So the get is actually a document that's written on parchment, similar to how a Torah scroll is written. And the husband will essentially authorize the scribe to write this get. The get is a 12 line document that really is about the logistics. Where is this happening? Who are the people getting divorced? There's no real profession of faith or discussion of God in that document itself, which sometimes comes up in uh, court cases. Um, but it's really pretty cut and dry about these two people are getting divorced. And then the husband will take that, that parchment and literally hand it to the wife. She will receive it. She will then walk with the document for a few steps, which signals that she is officially 
officially receiving it. And then at that point, the get itself, the document that's written on that parchment is actually destroyed because we don't want to be able to look back afterwards and be like, oh, this was spelled wrong or they had the location, you know, messed up. We don't want to be able to open that door. And so what you will receive afterwards is something called a patur, which is a receipt basically saying this is your proof that you're officially divorced. And so that is in a nutshell how the process works. However, there's a way to do it where you just get the husband to authorize a scribe and then he leaves. It's possible for it to be given in one location and received somewhere else. We've had cases where we're doing that and we'll actually have the wife receive it over Zoom and then again in person so that in the event that there's an attempt to cancel the get while it's in transit from location A to location B, we can rely on the Zoom ceremony (laughs) even if we aren't able to do an in-person one. So there's a lot of ways to adjust it to deal with unusual circumstances, which in our cases is often the case. And so it can be shifted as people need. That's very interesting because I have been through the GET process and um, I wrote an essay about it and um, I wrote about the experience of the very male room. It's a very um, sterile ex- experience in some ways, like a quiet room and the smell of old books. And I got several messages from people who said they also went through the get process and they also found it to be very overwhelming. Uh, the experience is very procedural. And I guess most people don't think there's another way to do it. Absolutely. And I think there's also a disconnect sometimes where most of our ceremonies in life have this real emotional component to them. You know, a baby naming, a wedding, a funeral. There are songs we sing and there are, you know, pieces we will say. And there's a real attention to the psychological process of that transition. And somehow with divorce, and this is true in both civil and religious divorce, we've kind of missed that. Like we forget that it's like a a real emotional emotional transitional moment. And so I will often just warn women about that going in that it feels very clinical. I hear that feedback a lot. And, and this is something that those of us who do this work professionally always have to work on is that for the person going through it, it's a once in a lifetime for you. It might be, you know, the third one you've done that day. So I will share a story sometimes. I remember having a C-section with one of my babies. And while I was on the operating table, there was a whole discussion in the OR about like which local restaurant made the best Kung Pao chicken, you know? And I'm like, hello. And so I think there's that piece there where, you know, for them, this was the, you know, 30th baby of the day, whoop-de-doo, you know, and for me, it's this big, big moment. So I think on the professional side, we have to work to have more of an understanding of how big of a deal this is for the other person. And there's a lot that can be done to add more of that emotional piece. And we always encourage people to bring someone because it's a very male space and that can feel really unwelcoming as a woman. Even if everyone's very nice and very warm, you notice that difference. And so bringing someone with you just to be a form of support and we will actually connect people with community volunteers. If they don't have someone or they don't have someone that they're comfortable asking, we'll match them up with someone who can go because it just, I don't know, it just feels really hard to do it by yourself. And it's not always the most emotionally satisfying kind of ceremony. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's not a it's not a good moment probably for most people anyway. Yeah, so. and even if it's long awaited, there's still, you know, changes involves loss. There's still a lot of really yeah, hard aspects. Exactly. And even if it's what you wanted, you know, that come with that kind of really big change in your life. Yeah. So let's talk again about those who want to get and are unable to get it. Some women waiting many, many years. Can you talk more about what the Aguna crisis looks like? What might go down that a woman would be waiting so long and what in the process would be happening to delay it. 
Of course. So there are a lot of structural places where things go wrong. And even if all the things don't go wrong for every person all the time, these are kind of the, the pain points in the process where you see these cases develop. One of them has to do with just how the best in system works in the United States. So typically, if you want to pursue a get, the way you pursue that is by opening a case with a Beftin. And they will then reach out to the other person, see if everyone's in agreement. And if you don't have agreement, and this is a contested get situation, what you then have is that there's sort of a classic process that the bait in will follow to pursue the get, where they will send sort of formal summons letters. And if the person doesn't cooperate, they'll issue something called a SAREV, which is an order of contempt that comes with social sanctions. The idea is that if someone has a say rep against them, you're not supposed to invite them to your house for Shabbat lunch or do business with them or really engage with them. The problem is that in the United States, there's no kind of central authority that gets to decide who can open a bait in and who can't. Anyone can open a Baton. A Baton can be a formal institution with a board of directors and published policies, or it can be three people in their garage, and it can be anything in between. And no one is playing with the same rule book. So some of them will follow a process closely, and others won't, and others will just make it up as they go along. And sometimes there's corruption involved, but sometimes there's really not. And so you have this tremendous variation in terms of the standards and procedures. And what that does is it really puts a burden on women going through this process to somehow know who to pick, which court do I go to? And I say sometimes it's like asking for OB recommendations when you're four weeks pregnant. Like it's that weird thing where you might not want to tell everyone that you're starting a divorce process, but how are you supposed to find out which are the courts that are that are known for having a responsible process? So essentially, it really puts a burden on women going through this process to choose a court that's going to have a responsible process and to choose a court that's really equipped to deal with their specific case. And especially if a divorce has complicating factors. So there's a history of domestic abuse. Maybe there are allegations of child abuse. Um, anything like that, you now need a Beftin that has some training and experience on those types of cases. And so you have to choose the Beftin wisely because once you've signed an RB arbitration agreement, that document is actually enforceable, not only in Jewish law, but also in civil law. And so once you sign that document, you are really stuck with that court. And so one of the real issues is just the confusion around the courts, the fact that there's no sort of central authority and the burden that it places on women in particular who are navigating this process. So we have a helpline really mostly for the purpose of getting people into a good bait in from the beginning. That was one of the biggest reasons we started it because once you're in, you're in, and it's really important to have a place to go to really talk through the options. And then another structural challenge is that many, many people are simultaneously trying to navigate the Jewish courts as well as the civil courts. So they might need something from the Jewish court, even if it's only a get. And they might need something from the civil court, even if it's only a judgment or only to get child support taken out of the person's paycheck or something pretty minimal. And what happens is that they're both really hard systems to navigate. They're not easy. And a lot of times people people will be getting one set of advice from their lawyer and another set of advice from their rabbi. And if you try to follow it all at the same time, it cancels each other out. Like it, it doesn't work. And so the fact that people are navigating both of these systems, it creates a lot of confusion. And I find that especially in domestic abuse cases, abusers are really good at manipulating systems. So if you have this really messy combination of secular and right. religious just, there's a lot of opportunities to um, manipulate that system and to keep people stuck in this sort of hamster wheel um, or stuck in a conflict about, you know, sometimes, for example, the wife might say, I want to go to the beat den to get my get. 
And the husband might say, well, if we go to the Beit Din, I want to deal with custody and finances in the Beit Din. And there could be a conflict over where they're going to be adjudicating the issues that come up in the divorce, which are mostly kids and money. Um, but you have to figure out where you're going to battle those issues. And that comes with different implications based on the community that you're in. So those are, I would say, are two huge pieces that impact how these cases get so stuck. And, and then the third piece I'll share is that the majority of the sort of full-fledged Aguna cases that we work on involve a history of domestic abuse. And so there's a real element where control has been part of this relationship for a very long time. And even when the victim of that abuse has done a lot to separate themselves, they've moved out, maybe the court case is finished, they don't have children in common anymore that are, you know, underage, who knows, the get can sometimes be this sort of last piece connecting these two people. And it can become the focus of all of that controlling energy that's been there all along. So I think it's also understanding how abuse works and how good abusers are at manipulating systems to their advantage can also help you understand how these cases come to be and how they can just go so wrong. To your third point about how the get can be the last piece that tethers a very uh, abusive situation, how would an abusive partner use the get to prolong the relationship so that the control can be continued or whatever the dynamic is. What, what is happening here? So it could be a few different things. It could be control over the person. I'm not letting you go. Um, and I, until I give you the get, you can't remarry. You can't be with someone else. So if you think about that, if I can't have you, no one can have you mentality that abusers will often carry, the get can feel like an opportunity to really get that. You know, if I can't have you, no one can have you. And you can make that happen in this really practical way if you're using the get as a form of punishment or leverage. But what you see happening quite a bit is people using the get to control the process. So now I'm never going to give you the get, but listen, if I'm not happy with how the divorce ultimately works out, you're not going to get your get. Um, and using the get as leverage to obtain a favorable custody settlement or a favorable property settlement. That is something that happens all the time. It can sometimes be more explicit, sometimes a little more implicit. We all kind of know this is going on, but we're not saying it out loud. But the element of extortion that's tied to the get issue is really, really huge. And it often goes unnoticed because these women do get their get, but they get it at a cost and they bear that cost for many, many years to come, but they don't count in any official tally of Agunot. But it really impacts the community. And I personally feel that just knowing this can happen, even if the extreme cases are pretty uncommon, just knowing that I might be waiting 20 years for my get really scares people and people negotiate differently when they're scared. And so it really has an impact on how negotiation happens in a much, much, much wider way than we really talk about or fully understand. Wow. Can you speak of specific stories? Would it be possible for us to hear of an example of a Naguna story? Sure. I'll share maybe one extortion story and then uh, a more classic Aguna story. But I'm sharing the extortion story because, again, I think these are the women that aren't counted as sort of as people who struggle with this problem, even though they do. So I had a case where this was a Hasidish couple. Um, they shared 10 children together. The wife did not work. They really survived through, in this particular case, a lot of public assistance. They were low income. And basically the deal that the husband offered was that he would keep custody on paper so that he would keep the subsidized apartment and she would actually care for the 10 children, but not have custody on paper. And wow. she agreed to it because she was really terrified that if she did it, she would never get her get. And I remember this case so clearly because I didn't know how to help her. She can't get public assistance because there's no get on paper. So I ended up sending her to a colleague who is a litigator to, you know, 
see what they could do about undoing the agreement, which is much harder than people think it's going to be. Um, But it's just a good example of the kind of financial costs that people pay because of the fear they have of get refusal. And that's the kind of situation you hear often, but it's, it happens all the time. And another example that I can share, there are so many examples that come to mind, but, um, one particular case, this was a wealthy couple there. The divorce was more complicated because they were so wealthy. There were so many assets, you know, it wasn't as simple as we have one car, you know, one minivan and one, one house, house and we're going to divide it up. It's a software bank accounts and the pension and the stock, you know, and the stock percentages and all of these pieces that were much harder to unwind. Very physically violent marriage. Um, but very controlled. The um, husband was very physically abusive, but was extremely careful not to hurt her in a way that would be visible. And so terrible violence, but all kind of invisible to the outside. And um, I remember the get refuser in this case moved out of the community. So he really lost that sort of initial opportunity for the community to encourage him to do the right thing, moved to a much much bigger community, had a very wealthy family. And it took really creative legal strategies as well as publicity to ultimately get it done. Um, And it went on, I want to say, five years around. I'm estimating a little bit, but it took about five years to resolve. Um, And they're still in litigation because the other individual in this case is a very high conflict personality. And like that fighting gives him energy. He wants to keep the fighting going. But the reason that we were able to help this woman get her get is actually because we identified an opportunity in the legal system where we could bring in the get. And that's a real challenge because our legal system has a separation of church and state. So the courts often don't want to hear about anything related to religious divorce. But there was sort of a particular opportunity where something came up in court that had to do with everyone's ability to move on with their lives. We felt like that was an opportunity to bring up the get. We coached the legal, the Agunas legal team who were not familiar with this issue on how to do that. And we actually had a bait in in the waiting room of the court to make the case that, hey, we can just do this right now. It didn't happen that day, but the judge denied the husband's motion in a way that was very unusual for how that state typically rules on that issue. And the husband gave the get within about two, three weeks of that court hearing. And so some of it is just being creative and seeing where is there a moment and can you jump to meet the moment. Wow. It's interesting that you say that we have a separation of church and state and that that's why uh, you can just fold the get into your legal proceedings. But it does work the other way around where you go to the bait in and you actually fold your divorce agreement in there. Right. So it is possible to put it all together, which creates its own complication if a woman, let's say, or a man doesn't understand that when they're doing the get, they're also deciding a lot more than than just their their divorce. Right. They can be very intertwined and they get intertwined in messy ways. So for example, in New York State, there's actually a law that limits how much religious arbitrators can decide when it comes to custody. So the law says that if a religious arbitrator is made and a bait in is a religious arbitration panel, so they kind of, it's a different language, but they fall in that category. If a religious arbitrator makes a custody ruling, the court can review that from scratch. The problem is a lot of people hear that and are like, okay, great. I can just go to bait in and say whatever and sign whatever, and it all gets thrown out the window. The problem though, is that just because a court can review a case from the beginning, doesn't mean that they have to or that they will. And courts are still recovering from the COVID backlog. They're often not looking for for extra cases. And so that might not work. And the other piece is that a lot of times a beaten will issue a ruling and that ruling will then get filed as an uncontested divorce. And so it's often not even going into the legal system as a product of religious arbitration, even if it is. So there's all these ways that 
how things actually happen on the ground versus what the law says on the books are not always in tune. And that's why just getting good advice is so, so critical because there's a lot of potential risk involved. And there was a lot of misinformation out there in the community. If I had a dollar for every time someone told me, oh, it's okay, I can just sign this. And then I'll say it was under duress. And I'm like, duress is more like oh, no. gun to your head, not like I was feeling anxious. Like you you shouldn't sign this if you if you have no intention of following it because it's not an okay agreement. And so a lot of it is just giving people the right information so they can make informed decisions where sometimes the misinformation can be so rampant that you end up thinking that something's not going to be a problem and then getting a really rude awakening when you try to go to the next step of the process and you realize, oh, I'm stuck with this setup that really doesn't work. Yeah. It makes me think of the much publicized story of Javi Weisberger's divorce. It was all over the news. She gave interviews that she signed for certain conditions in which the children will be raised. And then she violated those conditions. And in a very traumatic way, the children were removed from her care. In the end, she won that battle. But um, a lot of people were talking then about the consequences of signing something that you think is just um, not going to come back to bite you down the line. And it becomes like the like it, it happened in a basin and you don't expect the cops to show up at your door saying you've lost custody as a result of something you signed in a basin. Uh, actually, a question I have for you is, is your suggestion for someone going through a divorce with with a partner that it's fairly, you know, as divorces go, it's not abusive. It's fairly straightforward. Would you suggest that they still reach out to get guidance, even if they believe going in that it is going to be uncontested or fairly straightforward? I think guidance is always helpful personally. Um, I guess I'm biased in that we, we offer guidance, yeah. so that's what we do. And listen, it can be painful and stressful to share your story a lot of the time, so I don't want to discount that piece of it. That's not always a comfortable thing to do. Um, but I think that what's really the tricky piece here is integrating the two processes, the civil and the religious. So if you happen to have an attorney that knows about the religious divorce process, great, you might not need that additional guidance. But for the most part, you are going to be working with professionals that are trained in one system and not the other. So having just some advice about how the systems work together can be really important. And I will say, you know, every you know, advice giver has a different style, but the way that I approach things and that we approach things as ORA is that we're not here to tell you what to do. We're not here to say, well, Jewish law says this, so you better do that. Our goal is to give you information and we trust that you know what's right for you and your family. And some people who call care enormously about following everything to the T in terms of Jewish law and other people are like, listen, it's more important to my family than it is for me. So I want to just get a basic sense of, you know, what might be protective for me under Jewish law, but I'm not willing to upend the whole process to follow it. You know, it's it's really up to the person what they care about. But I think getting information never hurts. Because, again, there's so much misinformation out there that you can absorb without realizing it. And as cliche as it is, I really feel like knowledge is power. To know how a system works yeah. makes you more powerful in it. And it's it's worth it to have that support. And I'll share also, just in case there's anyone listening who might need this kind of support or know someone who does, we don't charge it all for our services. So it's it's time and time is, time is money, um, but it's yes. not an extra bill that you have to pay because we recognize that even if you have pretty decent resources, people are stretched very, very tight in divorce. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I'm so glad we put that out there. I now want to turn to the story a little bit in Kira's Joel. So Kira's Joel is actually where I grew up in, and it is a very particular world. It is <laughs> very, very insular, very, very Hasidic and um, very pious world. And I would say, I think I did not know of any Agunas growing up. And I don't know if that's because they were under the radar or there were fewer. I kind of made the assumption that Kirish Joel is the kind of place 
where things get done, so to speak. You know, there's this stereotype about what happens when a man doesn't want to get a get give a get that a couple of men meet him in the back of the shul and it happens. There was a story I read in I think Esquire about a a a whole squad of men who make sure the get happens. I don't know if it happens or not, but I kind of assume that Kiris Joel is a place with so much social pressure, with so much social leverage. The school systems are so powerful. There are so many ways of getting people to, uh, you know, socially, through social cues, fall in line. That I thought keeping a woman chained for many years maybe doesn't happen as often there. So I want to hear your thoughts about that. It's a very good question. Um, there is very much a stereotype that Curious Yoel resolves the problems through uh, physical violence. I, I will say for anyone yes. listening, that's, uh, that's not <laughs> how we do things at Ora. No baseball bats or, you know, brass knuckles here. Um, that being said, what's interesting is that when you think about, you know, are there are we just solving all the problems and that's why we don't have Aguno, sometimes we don't have Aguno in a community because we don't call them Aguno. And that's often kind of a flashpoint that I find that if I'm speaking to a beaten that says, I've never had an Aguna case, I have alarm bells I ringing see. because I'm thinking, well, you're not what does it take to be in that case? Do you have to be waiting yeah, 15 years? Um, how does that work? And there are actually studies that look at this in Israel and track what is the time frame from when a file is opened until someone is declared in Aguna. And um, so this question of who gets to be called in Aguna is actually a really important question. And I think sometimes numbers are low, not because the instances are low, but because we're not using that language. We we feel like that language is only for the really crazy cases. I also think that a challenge that happens is that sometimes when a divorce is really messy or a case is really complicated, or we all know that, you know, Yaeli is really difficult to work with. It just gets pushed, you know, the can gets pushed down the road. Let's deal with this later. Let's finish the this thing. Let's get the that thing done. You know, we'll deal with it later. And the risk of that is that sometimes people get very entrenched in their positions and the kind of social and communal pressure that would have been effective within the first six months of separation is just not effective seven years after separation. And so there's this element where it's almost like standing with your feet in concrete and, you know, it hardens around you. You stand there for a good long time. You're not going anywhere. You are stuck. Yeah. And so I think sometimes it's timing. Sometimes it's the question of, you know, who are we labeling? And there is a reality where insular communities do sometimes have an advantage in that when they apply social pressure, it is really unpleasant and you don't want yeah. to be on the other end of that. And I imagine also that is a deterrent factor. I often say that for every rally that we have outside of Get Refusers Home, there are five men watching that are like, I don't think I want to do that, that go ahead and give the get. And so, and we get a lot of gets before the rally. We tell someone this is where this is going to go. And before we will give them a date, we're planning to take the case public this Monday. And on Sunday, they'll go ahead and give a get. And they'll often say that has this has nothing to do with it. This was an open day in my schedule. Sure, you know, whatever you guys tell yourself. But the, th the threat of pressure is powerful. And I do imagine that in very insular communities, no one even has to say anything, but we all know what's going to happen if we, you know, go outside the lines too much. And we don't want that to happen because, you know, most people don't want to just light their life up in flames, you know, in order to do this. And so I think it comes up in a lot of different ways, but there is a strength to the insularity that can be really helpful in these types of cases, assuming that the community is on your side, which they may or may not be. Right. That's true too. What Talk more about the protests, which seems to be in your bag of tricks, or it's not in the category of brass knuckles. It's something that is done right by organizations like yours to bring, to pressure the, the husband, right? It's always the husband. 
Am I right? Generally, we've never had a case where a woman was not receiving a get go to pressure. But a lot of that has to do with the fact that that's a small category of cases. And we do not go to pressure right away. We are pretty thoughtful in how we pursue that and when we use it. I see. So what are the the strategies to pressure someone to give a get? And when are they applied? After what? Sure. So I would say first, we give a lot of people guidance early in the process. In order to take a case public, we're generally talking about cases that are a little later on in the process, usually at least eight months to a year post separation, um, where there's been an opportunity to see how things are playing out and where they're going. There's also generally some kind of a beat in process that has been attempted. So either it's led to a stay of a contempt order or it's fallen apart in some other way. But we generally find that for protests in the Orthodox community to be successful and effective, you want some rabbinic backing because otherwise the case gets stuck in like a he said, she said, and without having a third party rabbinic authority to say, nope, this person is really not cooperating with this process. It's really hard to galvanize communities to get involved. So there's typically some kind of a baked in process. Anytime we start a case, we always pursue any amicable means that are available to start us off. So are they fairly close together on terms? We try very hard not to get involved in the substantive issues of the divorce, but if they're really Almost there and some kind of informal mediation can get it done, that can sometimes be an option. If there is someone who has a relationship with the get refuser that's able to say, listen, you know, we'll often good cop, bad cop. So like, or is involved and you don't want this. And like, let's just finish this up. Like if someone can be that voice, that can be really helpful. Sometimes building rapport with the get refuser can work. We always try that first. We reach out to them. They share their story. We listen, we validate, like we really do everything we can to see how we can shift things before we go to pressure. Mostly because once you go to pressure, you're not having a like feeling validating conversation after that. Like it really cuts right. off all of the more amicable approaches. And pressure also comes with a risk in that the person can become more radicalized and they might, you know, I mean, it could be any number of things, but they might, you know, right. start connecting with other get refusers or become more extreme or feel like they've reached this place of no return um, where it's all over. Like everyone hates me anyway. I'm not going to be part of the community again anyway. So I might as well just withhold again for the next 20 years. So you don't want to get them into that place unless you have to. So once we've really exhausted the amicable efforts, we then start pursuing the pressure, which can be anything from listing their name in lists of people who have a say of against them in the newspaper. Um, it can be, be mean using media, social media, demonstrations outside their home or their place of business, mailings to their neighbors. It can be any number of things, just depending on who this person is. Are they part of the community? Are they not? What community are they part of? Sometimes it's doing a lot of information and grassroots education in that community to help people understand get refusal. There's often an idea that if a get refuser says, well, I'm doing this because this is the only way I'm going to see my kids again, helping educate people on how family court works, on why that's sort of a dangerous policy for us to set as a community. And so a lot of it is really changing how people think, inspiring people to action, and always trying to maintain enough of a thread that the get refuser feels they can come back from it. And so it's this kind of push and pull that you're trying to balance so that you help. And I was speaking with, you know, in Aguna recently about how pressure will likely be necessary, but she's also really nervous that it's going to radicalize him. And I was sharing how like it's true. It's okay. It makes sense to be nervous about that. That's a real concern and a real risk. And that my general feeling is that if we've tried everything else, there's not so much to lose. There can be safety risks. So this is where you have to know who you're dealing with and you have to know what what you think they're likely to do, how you think they're likely to retaliate. Do you feel like you're in a place to go through whatever stressful things come up as part of a retaliation. Um, And it's really, and that's why I think it has to be up to the Aguda. I really believe in 
Aguna advocacy that centers the Aguna in the process and puts her in the driver's seat because it comes with risks and there's often no one right way or no perfect yeah. answer. You're trying things and they come with risks. And I generally believe that something is always better than nothing. So I'd rather do a risky thing than do nothing, but only if she is okay with that and it's okay if she isn't or if she isn't right now. Yeah. And we might revisit that conversation, you know, at a later point. So not only can, let's say, protesting outside of his house cause him to become even more combative and become even more resistant to giving the get, like escalate the fight, but it could also um, cause the leverage you had to stop having the same kind of force. So let's say if you were threatening him to expose him to the entire community and ostracize him, if you've already ostracized him, then that probably is a card that is no longer going to be as effective in the future. So that's also something that you kind of are thinking about. Definitely. You play the cards and they're played. You can't, they don't have the same yeah. effect. You can have 20 rallies. Rally 17 is not, is, you know, the marginal not. impact is pretty <laughs> low. And I think that's why also doing this strategically, a lot of times what the public sees is the public protest. Like you don't see the rest of it because the rest of it is not happening publicly. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that there's this whole other, you know, strategy sort of playbook outside of what is publicly shown. Because once you do that, you can't undo it. So you want to do it thoughtfully. And we also find that being able to warn them that it's coming is fundamental because that is the moment where they're the most likely to make a move when they sort of sense that it's coming and feel anxious about it. And so yeah. you want to make sure you have that open di open line of communication that you give them that warning. And, um, and again, just, I'd rather go slow and strategic than like super fast and you've played every single card in the deck. And now, now what, you know? Yeah. Well, speaking of strategic and the things that we don't See, I think a part of what I think about when I think about taking action to pressure someone to give a get is the question of the children who are in the middle of this usually. Is that something you will think about? How will they feel if or how will it impact them and how can you mitigate the impact on them if the parents' divorce is now so public? It's a very important question. And I will say we think about it a lot. And I think that is one of the biggest factors that impacts Agunot's decision as to whether or not to pursue public pressure. Because if, if you think about it this way, say you have three children, if those three children are four, two, and three months, you are dealing with a very, very different situation than if those three children are 21, yeah. 18, and 16. So if all of your children are online, anything public they are seeing, um, they know that there is a rally. They know that they're, um, that they're seeing this. Now, we have a personal policy. We will not rally when that parent has their custodial time. We just won't do it. We don't feel... That that I mean, again, if they're sharing custody, some days they're going to have the children, some days they're not. Um, we will choose a more inconvenient date where they don't have their custodial time because we don't want children seeing that and being confused and, you know, not understanding what's going on and potentially being scared or intimidated. We're really careful in our rallies that we don't, we're not screaming personal insults. We're not breaking pitchforks. Like it's a, it's very above board. However, when you're four, how are you supposed to know the context and what's going on? And so that's sort of a line that we draw. And when it comes to teens and young adults, we really leave a note to decide what they think is going to be appropriate. And if there's a situation where, say, a child has a, a serious mental health issue and is going to be exposed to this information, that's where, again, you really have to work closely with the Aguna to assess what is safe and wise in this situation. And there are people who choose not to publicize for this reason. And there are cases where the children are really encouraging them to publicize. Kids know exactly what's going on, especially as yeah. they get older. They're aware of this dynamic. They're aware that this is happening. And they often have their own ideas of what they are and aren't willing to risk. And so 
I think it the, the impact is significant and you really have to be thoughtful about it. You know, when it comes to protesting in Curious Joel, I have been talking to people in Curious Joel about the protests to free Malky. And um, I think maybe outsiders wouldn't appreciate how it would be experienced in Curious Joel. It's a world that is very contained. People don't scream in the streets. You know, that kind of thing is so shocking. And a couple of people have told me, well, we completely agree that Malki should get her get. What's happening is unacceptable. But for women to protest in Kira's Joel, that is not the way to go. And that's not because they don't support the fight for Agunas, but because the act of taking these dramatic, um, you know, attention drawing actions is to them very off putting. So they, they go to the shopping center. They're used to Kira's Joel being a place where everyone's like, hello, how are you? And suddenly there are a bunch of women who are screaming. And it's like, eh. This is counterproductive. So I'm wondering how you think about that. I think the question of how much does the how matter, you know, is the goal to get the result at all costs, is the goal to um, do it in a way that's respectful to the community. That's a really tough question. And without, you know, knowing the ins and outs, you know, of this particular case, I think it's something you really have to figure out. I would say for us, you know, we when we go into a more ultra orthodox community or modern women are there, we will not have women, you know, singing or leading, you know, psalms, leading chants, because that kind of sounds like singing. Like we won't do things like that that I think are more obviously in, in your face. This is not what's normative in this community. Um, but sometimes you also don't have much of a choice. We have women yeah. there, you know, we're a female led organization. Um, I will often be speaking. We dress like modern Orthodox people. <laughs> we're not wearing yeah, the same yeah. outfits or the same, you know, head coverings. And so my goal always is to do things in a way that's as respectful to the community as possible, because you really want the community to be your allies. And there are sometimes points where there isn't someone who's more part of the community that's willing to get on the megaphone instead. And so I think it, it's kind of a balancing act in terms of doing what you need to be doing, um, but also being aware of where are there places where you can navigate things a little differently and be respectful. So I will say when I go to a meeting in Morrow Park, I will dress differently. I will like literally note it in my you know, calendar. In your calendar tomorrow, the longer exactly. skirt. I'll wear a different kind of wig. I'll wear stockings in the summer, even though I, I really hate stockings. But I will do things that wouldn't be considered necessary in the community that I live in. But I feel like it doesn't help my cause to show up that like in a way that I know is not considered modest in that community because I'm trying to get them to help me. I'm trying to get them to be my allies and my partners. So to the extent I possibly can, I'm going to want to do it in a respectful way. And you sometimes run into places where they're, you're either going to do nothing or it's going to ruffle feathers and there may not be another possibility. Tashit, I so admire the line you walk because I feel like you really have insight into the worlds that you do this activism in. And I think people will often be, will always be critical of activism if, you know, it's going to be in their faces, especially in places like yours, Joel. And, and the questions that you're articulating that you work through when asking how do we resolve these, these problems? I think are the right questions. How do we go to an insular world and raise awareness? Not everyone's going to love it, but also not trying to be deliberately provocative, unnecessarily confrontational. I think that that to me seems like the right questions to be asking. And um, I think if I was a woman in Kiru's Joel still walking in the shopping center, seeing people protest, I would have two reactions. I would at once feel like eh, it's too much, but also understand it's necessity in some cases that the problems are not going to resolve themselves outside of more drastic action. And I will 
will say, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, go I was going to share if I time to share a quick story. I was working on a case once in a particular Hasidic community, um, like one of the sort of subsections. And it was a really hard case. And it was going really, it was very hard to find allies, like a real uphill climb in the snow kind of. And I remember feeling like maybe... I don't know, maybe they really do just kind of hate women and maybe this just like isn't a good community. And I've always really believed that you cannot change, you cannot create change in a community that you don't respect at a certain level. And I remember this case really challenged me on that. And then it happened to be I was driving home that day and I ran over a nail and I got a flat tire and I needed to pick up my kids and I'm like at the side of the road with a flat tire and triple a sort of fun fact, triple a will tow you if you don't have a spare tire with you, which I didn't have. Um, but there's something called Chaveirem, which is like an Orthodox triple a that you don't need to have a spare tire. So I call Chaveirem and they come and a group of guys, you know, get out of the van and they're from the same Hasidic community as this case I was working on. And they, you know, lift up my van and give me a tire and don't charge me anything and send me on my way. We're so like friendly and kind. And I remember driving home and just being like, oh, right. Like people are people <laughs> and there are yes. good people everywhere and there are obnoxious people everywhere. And the nature of exactly. my job is that I sometimes meet a few more of the obnoxious people than you <laughs> would on a typical <laughs> encounter with these communities. But to just have that reminder that we have different styles and we have different clothing, but that there is that common humanity and that baseline respect for there are beautiful parts of this culture as much as there are aspects that I might really not understand or wouldn't want to practice. And so I think holding both of those things for me has been important. I have another question um, of something I read that the mothers of the get refusing husbands are often the instigators. That's what I read on social media, kind of not sure if it's blaming the mothers or this is often actually a problem. I would say in the types of cases that I typically work on, that's they're not necessarily the instigators. Um, I think it's likely more common in very young divorces because in if you're getting married when you're 19 and 20, your parents are involved in your everyday life in a way that they might yeah. not be when you're 35. And so, yes, a, a couple getting divorced who are 19 and 20, the parents are super involved. And sometimes the parents are much harder harder to work with than the children because all that like protective, you know, tendency that we have for our kids really, really comes out. I would say very, very common though for mothers to be supporting get refusers and really feel like they're doing the right thing. And um, it can definitely be a problem. I don't know. I feel like you can change a lot of people's minds. I don't know if you're changing this person's mom's mind. I mean, people like bring their yeah. children muffins on death row. Like that's a little bit how, you know, we're, we're biased when it comes to our children. Um, yeah. And I think sometimes in rare cases, parents can be the voices of reason that can help the child see beyond the moment into the future. But the message I always have for families when I do speak to mothers, fathers have the chance is that I really believe that get refusal is actually very bad for the get refuser as well as it is for the victim. I think it is corrosive to everyone. I have not seen anyone's life get a whole lot better, even if they extorted for money or they got that Section 8 apartment. I have not seen anyone's life improve. I have not seen anyone have a better relationship with their kids because they withheld a get from these children's mother for X amount of years. Like it, it really destroys everyone. And I actually think that if you love someone, you should encourage them not to do this. And it sounds crazy, but I've spoken to people thinking about get refusal who are at the early stages of the process. And there really can be an opportunity to change their perspective and encourage them not to do this. But I really believe that if you love someone, you don't want this for them. Like this is not helpful for them any more than it's helpful for the other person. It, it hurts everybody. Everybody loses. And the best thing we can do when someone we love is getting a divorce is help them think beyond the moment into the future, because that gets very lost in the conflict of divorce. And what we all want is to move on with our lives. This relationship didn't work. That's really sad. There's a lot to grieve there. 
But at a certain point, you if we love someone, we want them to have a future. We don't want to be hearing about the latest update in their divorce for the next 20 years every time we see them, yeah. you know? And so that can sometimes help. And also parents just cannot always get the objectivity needed to see that when their darling baby is, you know, is in conflict. I love everything that you're saying. It's so interesting. Thank um, you. I want to wrap up well to get to this unusual place let's say with a sex strike which i'm sure you heard about definitely so you want to share your thoughts on that well let's let's tell the viewers what it is and um could you do that and then maybe what your thoughts are on it Sure. So I'll say very broadly, there's um, an activist named Adina Miles, who is her handle was Flatbush Girl. And she really called for women to basically not go to the mikvah, which is a ritual bath that in traditional Jewish marriages, you go, you don't have intimacy during the week that the wife is menstruating and afterwards. And then you go to this ritual bath. Um, I'm sure that's a, a whole other episode that you've probably done or will do. Um, and then you sort of reunite. So the push was for women to sort of choose not to participate in this process in order to support Agunot. Uh, what I will say overall, I will say part of my philosophy, I guess, my approach to advocacy is that I really believe that advocacy sort of happens in an ecosystem. It's never sort of one person or one thing or one moment that just changes everything overnight. I wish it were that easy, but it's not. Um, and I think it takes actually different kinds of voices doing different kinds of things that collectively can move the needle and have an impact. I also decided a long time ago, um, this is, as you can imagine, an issue where people have really strong opinions, not only about what's right and what's wrong, but about what's the right way to go about this and what's the wrong way to go about this. And I really decided a long time ago for myself that I was not going to spend a lot of my energy sort of criticizing how other people are trying to do it. Um, because at the end of the day, it's really easy to criticize and it's very hard to do things. And so I'll say, you know, this particular kind of thing, it doesn't really fit the style of how I advocate or how my organization advocates. Um, that being said, again, getting too deep into, oh, that's the wrong way to do it. That's not where I want to put my energy. Um, again, I think that multiplicity of voices is really powerful. And the voice that that both myself personally and my organization have cultivated is a voice that's a little more collaborative with rabbinic leadership, a little more kind of of a mainstream kind of voice. And there are going to be people who connect with that and people who don't as much. And that's OK. Um, and let everyone find a way to advocate that they can connect with. You know, that would be such a great thing because we certainly don't want apathy. And, um, and I think what can be a really positive element of these types of moments, whether or not you love it, you hate it, you're on this side, you're on that side, is that they can create a sense of urgency that can be hard to really generate and hold on to this feeling of like, oh, that's so sad. Yeah, that thing happens versus no, yeah, yeah. we got to do something now. Like this is a moment. And so I think that urgency can be very powerful. And we, you know, we are always happy to see people talking and thinking about the issue. And there's going to be very different takes on what's the right approach, what's the wrong approach, what's this, what's that. Um, but I think the, the bigger picture is, you know, do we see this as an issue that matters? Do we see this as an issue that matters now? And do we feel like we personally have an obligation to be part of creating change. And a lot of what we do is try to encourage people to see it that way, you know, that this might not happen to you, but this will happen to someone you love. So one thing that we spend a lot of time doing is advocating for couples to sign a halachic prenup, which is basically a document you sign before you get married that creates an incentive structure where we're much less likely to see the get withheld or used in an abusive way later on. And we we pitch this starting at the high school level. So pretty young kids wow. in the grand scheme of things. And the way I present it to them is that, you know, 
I hope you'll never need this. And you probably won't ever need this. Most people don't. But like someone that you know is going to need it. You know, yes. like your roommate from seminary's older sister, your cousin, your, you know, lady who walks your dog when you go on vacation. Like someone in your world is going to need this. And if you sign it and you commit to being a part of creating change, then you're going to help someone else out there. So really trying to inculcate that sense of personal responsibility. This isn't just like, I, as we say in the Orthodox community, I never, you know, it's a sad thing that happens, what you can do, <laughs> um, that there are things you can do. There are things you can do today. Um, there are ways to be part of creating change. There are lots of ways. So it doesn't just have to be a more extreme thing. There are lots of different ways that you can get involved. And to just encourage people to feel like there's something that I can do and there's something that I should do. Because I hope this doesn't happen to you. I hope I wouldn't wish this on anyone. But the the Jewish world and the Orthodox world in particular is so small and so well interconnected that you probably know people who are struggling with this without realizing it. And so you should feel that sense of engagement and responsibility. And what we try to do at Ora is give people pretty like low key actionable ways that they can get involved because there are the activists that are willing to do like really dramatic things. And then there's the regular people that, you know, might, might not feel comfortable doing something that's more out of the box, but we can give them a whole menu sort of of options to get involved. Is there anything else or does perhaps in the legal realm that you haven't covered that you might share with us? Sure. So we do a lot of legal education and advocacy work. So we're in touch with groups of attorneys who are looking to pass legislation about the get. We have a lot of experience with that. So we're able to help people do that. And part of what we do is actually bridge the rabbinic and civil system. So bringing lawyers to bringing rabbis, excuse me, to meetings of lawyers and legislatures and really bringing the system together so that it's collaborative and not sort of not conflict-based. We also do a lot of work in educating attorneys and judges about this issue, helping people understand how they can bring this issue into the court system, even things as simple as putting in good language into a settlement agreement that addresses the gap, but in a way that's protective in case there are problems later on. Um, we also do a lot of work in um, providing support to Agunot. The reality is that this is not a short process for the most part. And we recognize that this takes time and that there's a lot of real trauma involved. And so creating communities where Aguno can support each other. Um, and we do art therapy groups and sort of processing oh. groups. And we have support groups at different stages. And we have groups for women just starting out in divorce. And really, um, there is there's an element where I've done this work for a long time and I know a lot, but I haven't lived through it. So there's something different you can gain from someone who is living through it, who you can, yeah. you know, really feel a sense of, of just less loneliness. And so also changing the experience of get refusal. And then a lot of work with rabbis, with communities, our biggest pieces are defining the decision to withhold a get as a form of domestic abuse and really explaining why that's important and helping people just think about this from like a policy and structure perspective versus, oh, my friend, Yossi, he's such a nice guy. He must be doing this for a good, for a good reason kind of thing. So helping people think a little more big picture. How did you get to do this kind of work? What drew you to do this? So my background is as an attorney, and I initially got interested in domestic abuse work, then in domestic abuse work in the Orthodox community. And then initially, I thought I wanted to be a litigator and help religious women fight for divorces and for custody. And throughout my experience in that side of things, I felt like the get was always the kind of invisible boogeyman in the room that everyone was thinking about and strategizing around. And so when I had the opportunity to work more closely with the get, I figured, oh, you know, this would be helpful to kind of build my skill set. And I ended up really falling in love with community work and mm. um, and just feeling like this is a, as much a social and cultural issue as it is a halachic one. And there is a lot that can change for the good when we can really galvanize communities and do that in a consistent and intentional way. And so that's what I really love to do. And I get both the 
blessing and the challenge of, you know, working in the community that I'm also part of and living in. And so that comes with complexities, but I also have three daughters and I, Um, I really feel like we, like the needle has moved already in the time I've been doing this work. And I have a lot of hopes and dreams for the community that I want them to be walking into when they are old enough to be doing this kind of thing and really in this space. Since you know the legal system, I hope that I can ask you a question that I get a lot on my YouTube channel that is a little bit off topic of the Aguna uh, issue. It's about couples where one parent stops being religious or not as religious as they were when they got married, and there's then a fight for soul custody to the religious or more religious parent. Are you in any way able to speak to that? It's an issue that does come up in our cases at times, and I think it's very much in flux. Um, I think for a long time, the feeling very much was that the best thing for children is consistency. And if you sort of undertook marriage and child rearing within the ultra-Orthodox community, then that's what you have to do. Um, the problem is it doesn't really work. I don't I don't think someone who's formally ultra orthodox can like successfully pretend to be ultra orthodox for yeah. you know half the week every week. Like it's just th- those are pretty different lifestyles. Um, and I think it's really, really shifting. And I I think that in 10 years it's probably gonna flip the other way. But I think that courts are very much seeing things differently and um really sort of respecting the other parents' right to have access to the children more than they are concerned about the children being confused. And it's a really complex and messy issue because it also gets into questions of like who pays for yeshiva or Jewish summer camp or who makes those decisions and how does that work? So I think you are still seeing the, you know, observant parent having more of that decision-making power, more custody time, but the ability to say, nope, you don't have any access, I think that's changing. That doesn't mean there aren't cases where it's still happening that way. You know, for sure there are. Um, I think it's changing. And in general, one of the really messy things about family law more broadly is that a lot of family law is very squishy. It's like, you know, what seems fair? What seems best for the kids? It's this very loosey-goosey element where a lot of it comes down to how much does the judge like you or not like you? And so you also have to factor that in who does the judge sort of it was the better parent um, based on whatever mm. set of assumptions they're making, which may or may not be uh, super, you I know, super yeah. backed up. So you have to kind of combine those two pieces. But I, I think there is change in the air. Um, and I know that there is a lot more, I think, anxiety in the Orthodox community about are we losing that ability to maintain it? And I will also note that is a tough spot for kids to be in. Um, If you are living really with both feet in the ultra-Orthodox community, but you have one parent who's totally out, that gets really messy and complicated in terms of your social life, your marriage prospects. Um, And so finding a way to do this that's fair to the parents, that's fair to the child, that balances social norms with the trauma of parental separation is really messy. I don't know that there are easy and obvious answers on what's right every bit of the time. Oh, Keshet, I so very much enjoy talking to you, all of your insight. This was a very, very special experience for me. Um, I guess the whole topic is close to my heart. So um, thank you so much for your time. I want to know if there was anything else you wanted to share before we wrap up. I guess the last piece I'll just share because we get this question a lot of like, You know, if someone can't get a get, like, why don't they just leave? You know, like, what's the big deal? Like, this is America. You could do whatever you want to do. And I think part of it, and this speaks to what we were just talking about, there there kind of is no such thing as like just leaving. Like leaving is a real operation and you have to want that. And um, not everyone does. But I think that the majority of the people we're working with are people who love orthodoxy, who want to be part of the orthodox community, who believe very deeply in sort of the theology of the community and want to be here. And we very much feel that if anyone should leave the community, it's the perpetrator of abuse, not the victim. So we're here to create another pathway, but to just, 
I think sometimes on the outside, it can be hard to understand why people would want to be part of this. But there is also so much community and support that people can get from being plugged into a community like the Orthodox community. And there are actually studies that track how domestic abuse survivors do after leaving and being connected to religious support can really help outcomes and, you know, change them in a positive way. So to just kind of present that complexity, that it's easy to read this as a story of, oh, religion always hates women and here's, you know, Exhibit 25. And you could tell the story that way and read it that way. But there, I think, is really so much more nuance and complexity in terms of people who love this community and want to be part of it and believe in this faith and are struggling with this piece of it and how it manifests in this sort of specific legal and cultural moment that we're in. So there's just a lot of that complexity. But for me, I do this work because I love being Orthodox and I love this community and I want to see us be able to grow in a positive way in these areas. And for most of the Agudor I work with, they they really feel similarly. They want to be here. They love this community and we want them to feel embraced and valued by the community, even while they're going through this really difficult thing. You know, I don't think I've ever met a person who left orthodoxy because they were a Naguna, as far as I know. Do you know anyone? I know of people who it was one of multiple things that made them decide, but I've never seen someone like everything was great and I was super happy and now this thing happened. Goodbye. Um, And it's interesting because it comes up all the time. Every group that I speak to that's outside the Orthodox community. Why don't they just leave? Why don't they just leave? And I think part of it is underestimating what it means to leave, but also not seeing that kind of full picture of also what people gain from being parts of communities like this. Yeah, exactly. Um, Keshet, where can people find out more about Aura and anything else you might want to share, like a link or a resource? Sure. So our website is www.getora.org. Our contact information is on there. Um, I am also both Ora is on Instagram at Ora Agudot um, with one A, and I am on it just under Keshet Star. And so you can follow us there for updates, upcoming rallies, any information. And the main thing I would say is that you don't have to be at sort of a certain stage of desperation to reach out for help. We're really happy to just have conversations with people, share more about this issue, and offer support or even just a conversation about the topic for anyone who's interested in that. So So don't hesitate to reach out. Our contact information is all online and we are happy to help. Great. Thank you so much. It was so great to talk to you. Same here. Thank you so much for having me and for asking such thoughtful questions. Yes. Enjoy your lunch. We still have a little bit of time, just barely. (laughs) There we go. Thank you so much.